Hello again. Uh, so we are now uh, going to our fourth panel. So as we say, usually in English, the last but not the least. <laughs> and as you could see as well, all the notions are also very much connected, you know, uh, between artistic collaboration, the question of professional development, environmental sustainability. And we talk a lot in past panel as well on the question of inclusion. So in a way, it's also a good way to have this um, panel now. So. I will uh, give the word to uh, Sophie, Sheda, and Yamam for this um, for this uh, session. Um, so, for the last panel, the format is the same as well. You will have more discussion between our moderator and our two uh, guest speakers. There will be a time for Q and A here in Helsinki and also online. And when you introduce yourself, you need to introduce your organization and also yourself for visual impairment people. So thank you very much and enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Marie, and thank you uh, to On The Move for welcoming us here for this. <laughs> And um, well done, everybody. You've made it to the last session of the day. I hope you still have some mental space left to talk about diversity and inclusion in digital cultural mobility. Um, my name is Sophie Dowden. I am the project manager at the European Choral Association. And I am in my mid 30s. I have wavy red hair. Um, I am white and I'm a woman wearing a white shirt. Um, as it is a principle of inclusion to not speak for others, but let them speak for themselves, and not just because it makes my job easier, I will pass over to the panelists to introduce themselves. And so, Jeda, over to you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. And on behalf of myself, thank you for staying with us. <laughs> my name is Jeda Bergsodablum. I'm an independent um, festival programmer, creator, and cultural manager who has a uh, more than 20 years of experience in arts, um, 14 years as a very intense festival programmer background and since uh, end of 2015 based in Helsinki, uh, I'm running my small organization called Miklagard Arts with a certain focus on um, transnational and transcultural collaborations and since the time uh, I settled my new chapter of my professional life in Finland. I also engage in public advocacy on diversity, equity and inclusion. And I worked for Finnish, uh, Finnish Ministry of Education and Culture as an expert to produce arts, culture and diverse Finland reports to propose uh, some policy recommendations. And it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, so uh, my, my, my description. Um, my heart bleeds to say it. <laughs> I'm late 40s. <laughs> a white woman, uh, medium short, dark brown hair, and I'm wearing glasses. Comes with the H. And currently, I'm wearing white shirt and um, blue jacket. Thank you. And Yaman, over to you. Thank you. Yaman al is the name. Uh, I'm a middle aged man, early 50s. I think I'm white, dark hair. I have glasses. And shirt is blue I think. you had to check but it is true <laughs> yes uh, well my background um, uh, my background is in linguistics uh, translation interpretation as well as i have an, uh, my master degrees in, in decision and policy uh, analysis i've worked with the european equality law for more than 10 years and international human rights law as well uh, for a number of years i've been the equality diversity manager at the National Touring Theatre of Sweden. Uh, today, I'm an independent consultant and researcher within the cultural sector. Wonderful. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, so up to now, today, uh, we have been talking about digital cultural mobility, how it works, uh, the professional development aspects involved, environmental sustainability, and how that relates to uh, inclusion. Um, and also, it was brought up earlier, the topic of issues of access uh, that are uh, posed by our operations in the digital world. But before we get to the problems, I would like to start with the positive side and ask our panelists, uh, what benefits do we see from digital mobility when we're talking about inclusion as opposed to traditional cultural mobility? 
Okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm so happy because uh, the earlier panel discussions and all the contribution and inputs uh, actually brought us to this point that we can allow ourselves to be more critical about the work we do, about the spaces we operate and the sector that uh, within we do our work. Uh, and since our specific theme is inclusion, I would like to acknowledge uh, the vivid and very important contribution of the uh foreign backgrounded people or uh artists and cultural workers who live and operate other than their birth countries and also all underrepresented minorities because that part is also a very important part of arts and uh, cultural sector as an ecosystem so when it comes to inclusion that we should always think in a broader sense uh, but um, we really talked about or mentioned uh, during the earlier panel discussions important points. Uh, what I can bring on the top of it that uh, when we talk about digital inclusion or inclusion at all, we should always bring the table or, or to the narrative rep representation who gets to speak and whose uh, expertise is acknowledged. And in that sense, I, I'm very grateful that On The Move invited me here as one of the Finland-based uh, presenters as being non-Finnish. Uh, I feel this important because I can at least identify myself in, in this immigrant uh, art professional community. So uh, it's important whom uh, is invited to this kind of uh, discussions and of course accessibility and lacking capacity or developing capacity resources networks but at the heart art at the heart of all discussion i believe that we need to talk about social justice because many global injustices that we are facing today has something to do with the social inequalities that we ourselves from the positions uh, we operate somehow start and maintain and hopefully uh, one day we will change and make it much more better for everyone after this little bit background information i i would like to invite all of us just to think about uh, the benefits from the digital inclusion and i'm telling this being in one of the uh, let's say um, most advanced technically countries in finland and wherever you go in public spaces that you have an access to a 4g 5g free wi-fi and of course we are also able to communicate in certain um let's say certain languages that are access accessible only for those who can speak so from that position i would say yes digital the the the, the visible part of the iceberg it's incredible because we had an access to certain knowledge and input the other side of the world and those knowledge were operating in the mostly in english so for those who speak that language it was possible to reach uh, and also there was another way uh, of operating because during the pandemic when uh, when the lockdown uh, really hit arts and cultural sector to have digital content was the way but still everything that i'm trying to describe right now comes from a certain privileged position so if you don't have an access earlier also mentioned uh, to reliable internet connection are we able to say that the privilege this digital events provided us in this very privileged context is available for everyone so it's a question of inclusion and if we are not able to communicate in this lingua franca that we are using for this specific event are we able to get all the knowledge that we would like to learn and and inspired by from the other part of the world so i believe all those questions has something to do with the local context and which kind of privileges that we have as the art professionals and who has those privileges and the and the positions to see real benefit of it so maybe we can continue a bit dark side later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and and Yemen, yeah, um, we've heard about this uh, idea that the, the internet is a, a great democratizer. And that is so different from the physical world. So what do you think of this idea? Does digital mean more democratic? I'm not a specialist in, in the digital world, but it seems to me that um, 
it's undeniable that that the internet provided more possibilities and historically speaking i think what the internet and the digital world did is um it's created access to information opportunity to be a part of the discussion uh, for more people that didn't have those opportunities um and in that sense it is it is a new democracy it's a de-democracy if you wish uh, but when it comes to inclusion, I think I'm slightly less optimistic uh, because inclusion is not about, at least not about opportunities. I mean, historically speaking, if you look at the at the Western world, at least uh, we've seen that the principle of the idea of equality of opportunity have been the dominating one for 50, 60, 70 years or something. And it's been the driving force behind a lot of social policy, labor policy, but also other, other policies, but we're still very much in equal societies. So the equality of opportunity does not create, you know, real equality. <laughs> it creates a formal equality. And, and on the democratic level, it's fine. But when it comes to, to access to the decision making, I think there is there is there is another thing. It's about power dynamics rather than formal access to be a part of the bigger group. So I'm I'm less optimistic about the value of the digital for the you know inclusion exclusion processes because they are about power dynamics rather than just simple access to to um, to new fora. Yeah, access doesn't uh, mean that your voice is heard or that you are in control of the situation. Um, yeah, and, and so, in fact, many of the, the issues that we're seeing in uh, the physical world are just replicated in the digital world or um, appear in, in different ways. Um, so, <laughs> as we've started, I think we can continue uh, with how in digital cultural mobility, then we um, we're seeing challenges um, and barriers to diversity and inclusion, and who is impacted uh, by these challenges? Mm. Oh, thank you. I think that's a very important question, and it might take you know hours to to discuss it, but. Um, um, whatever uh, context that we are talking about, if we want to scan it, if that specific space is diverse enough uh, and creates equal opportunities for everyone to produce, to develop themselves, then we can talk about a certain inclusion and, of course, accessibility and who is the marginalized one who, who gets benefit from this kind of spaces. But the most important thing that how are we going to create another way of working in this very given, let's say, so uh, quote unquote new spaces when it comes to digital, because I totally agree what your mom opened up. I'm sure he's going to give more details about the power dynamics, because if we are able to implement uh, the certain dynamics which creates inequality in our ecosystem in any means that we are exposed to or started to use, let it be digital or other, then we will have similar difficulties and similar barriers in a, in a, in a, a bit different story, but exactly the same core with that spaces. So uh, it's very important to see, and I also wrote my master thesis about it. I mean, what are the competences? And I was so happy today, one of the panel discussion, this competence came as a question or comment, because I believe that uh, as an art professional, that we have to understand the um, management of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a, as a competence which is required for us to operate in the current ecosystem and to create our work in a meaningful way. So I started to work for art field and that time it was okay to send the contracts through by fax. So, but we learn many things. We learn how to use Outlook. We learn how to use Microsoft Office to make a kind of presentation and we developed our ability on the finances and so on and so on. So I believe that this DEI or inclusion in general when it comes to sustainability, I think all the understanding comes with the eco crisis should be seen as a new competence that we need to develop and learn. And because of this learning, unlearn some of the ways that we were working earlier to make it more inclusive. Um, it's just a kind of new way of doing. So if you look at 
the whole thing from that angle, I believe it's a little bit um, takes the, the, the pressure on the shoulder because it's very hard from every direction to really reach uh, an ultimate inclusion at the end. Uh, all process leaves some people and some projects behind and some continue. So that's a part of the business that we are doing. But actually, this is a new understanding. This is a new way of working which will enhance our well-being in general in the whole arts and cultural sector. So this is how I see <laughs> a follow-up question to that, actually. Um, have you uh, experienced or um, can you maybe talk a bit about uh, when you get resistance to this kind of change um, mm -hmm. in an organization? Is yeah. it something you've experienced? Is it? Uh, well, let's put it this way. I mean, the change is the hardest thing <laughs> on an individual <laughs> level. And I see, first of all, I see resistance to change in me. Uh, when I moved to Finland, um, I knew that this is a new space for me and I need to uh, adapt myself. But of course, it was hard after a certain years of practice to adapt. So basically, resistance to change is quite human. And when it comes to, of course, to make uh, the spaces, the institutions, our practices more inclusive and try to bring in um, underrepresented voices or historically oppressed uh, narratives into this discussion on an equal level requires a full set of changes in our daily work. And it's not easy. And of course, during the pandemic, everybody was earlier also said in the survival mood, and maybe there is so much going on in arts and culture, and we always operate with very limited resources. Mm -hmm. So nobody has incredible time to do everything. And then uh, you feel a little bit distance because if you go too much analysis, you feel a bit paralyzed. Okay, what am I going to do and how am I going to achieve it? It creates a resistance. So, of course, all my advocacy work was how to deal with this kind of resistance mindset mm -hmm. and attitude and under which conditions that we could motivate others and each other, you know, to do in a different way. Okay, we might come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, ma'am, would you have something to add on, on what kind of challenges and, and barriers are, are there in terms of diversity and inclusion in the uh, cultural mobility sector? I think partially what Jada was saying is, is the resistance and the, the, the strong resistance that you can see in organizational level, uh, I think explains very clearly that this is not a just re redistribution of resources. It is actually re redistribution of power. It's again, it's about, about power dynamics. And historically, we know that the notion of equality can be very formal and look nice without actually having effect on the reality and having a more redistributive um, approach when the idea is to actually challenge the, um, the power dynamics. Um, and it's, it's when the power, it's when somebody is actually raising the issue of redistributing the power that, re that the resistance comes. I mean, we don't see much resistance in including specific persons on boards, like we have this one person, you know, of a certain mm -hmm. <laughs> ethnic or racial background, somebody with a set specific disability, women, men, it's fine, everybody is happy about it, mostly. Uh, but when it comes to the real issue, it's redistributing how decision, the, the power of how decisions are made, who is making the decision, on what merits the decision are made, mm -hmm. and how do they impact other people, that's when the resistance comes into the, in the picture. Um, so uh, in, for me, it's, from where I am, it's, uh, for me, it's, I mean, arts and culture is about creativity and, um, and critical thinking. And if it's predominantly a sector that is dominated by one specific or two social groups or demographics, how much critical thinking is there left? Um, this is not to disqualify a majority. But this is to say that the critical approach, you know, it's, it includes the pluralism or plurality of opinions that actually have an impact on the decision making process or the chain of decisions made. Who is getting funding? Why they're getting funding? On what merits they're getting funding? For how long they're getting money? 
who get to move digitally or in the real world is the underlying decisions that are the most interesting ones. And I think there are no solutions for that because this is about human behavior. Uh, this is where tokenism is, is not very helpful. And I think I, I was, I like the idea that was mentioned. I think it was Matthew, what you said with the previous, uh, I'm sorry if, if it was a wrong name, but you said something about the, the uh, in the previous um, session about being a laboratory. I think when it comes to inclusion, it is the same idea. We should see ourselves as a laboratory because the inclusion, the diversity of human experiences is essential to the critical thinking, but we will never solve that forever. There is no, you know, there is no button to push it and, and everything happens. So it's about learning from the mistakes and incremental process, just like the decision process are incremental. So we should replicate the decision process in making small changes one at a time to move forward um, beyond that resistance. Uh, that is about the power. Who is making the decision? That's for me, that's the main question. There's, uh, there's a book actually that uh, I've been reading recently um, by Adrienne Marie Brown. It's called Emergent Strategy. And uh, in there, uh, there is a quote about it's better to act and then uh, apologize than to not act and have to justify why you didn't. And I think this is a fear <laughs> that uh, a lot of people have because I think um, more and more we appreciate the importance of the issues of diversity and inclusion. And that might be in varying degrees in different places, in different countries. Um, but the, the profile of the topic has, um, has been raised. And um, what would you say to people then who are worried about, the, about being accountable, essentially, for when things go wrong? Hmm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> of course, accountability matters uh, because at the end um, we are talking about relevance of the um, work we do. We are talking about the relevance of the arts and cultural institutions uh, for the societies in which they operate and offer their content. Uh, and how to link what your mom said about democracy, because I think we need to see the situation through different lenses. Therefore, this inclusion as a working method and, and as an approach, is, it's, it's very useful because if we think about an art scene, exactly how we describe, uh, predominantly governed by a homogeneous thinking, let's put it this way, and are we able to talk about, and if the participation of uh, out of mainstream makers be, let it be the immigrant or artists and cultural workers or underrepresented minorities because of their race, ethnical background, gender uh, identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomical situation. We all know that uh, little details about our identities somehow uh, creates our position in the societies. Then we cannot talk about real participation and democratic decision making structures, uh, which are since we are in Finland, in many European countries, the source of everything. And if people with different and diverse perspectives, which is also a fact, produces much more uh, innovative solutions as a group, are not included in that structure, are we able to really talk about social um, justice and the well-being of the society? Uh, for instance, Finland right now, the, um, the population system uh, classifies uh, residents and citizens uh, based on their mother tongue. So we are called of uh, either foreign born or foreign language speaking. Uh, citizens and residents of Finland and in the metropolitan area, including uh, Espoo, uh, Vanta and uh, Helsinki, the three big cities, 20% uh, of population currently consists of people who do not speak the native languages or official languages, Swedish and Finnish and also Sami. Uh, of course, it's a big number and all uh, prognosis for the future shows that uh, this number will grow uh, with time. So basically, we are talking about people, all art institutions needs to consider as a possible audience. And we are talking about people who uh, contribute uh, to the um, um, financial system of the country as being a taxpayer and of course how to distribute their tax that they also get a certain arts and cultural services uh, 
as a return uh, to their contribution. I mean, all these are important questions when we think about uh, the inclusion. But at the end of the day, <laughs> when it comes to what to do, yes, there we see some difficulties. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Yaman, would you have anything to add on the responsibility of cultural organizations to, to act in this field? Accountability. And accountability. My favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think well, you, you're absolutely right what Said was saying. Um, there was an incident some years ago when a programmer asked me, I'm, I'm from Arab, Arab origin, and, and I was asked by a programmer who was making a theater program for one of the uh, Stockholm um, suburbs, which is, a, there is a big Arabic speaking majority there. And I was asked, what do you think the young people in this area would like to see on the stage? And I, seriously, first I thought that was a joke. But I then realized it was a serious question. And then I, then I realized how big the problem is. Because I'm in my 50s. I am from a higher middle class family. I lived for 30 years in Sweden. I have no clue what these young people who are born in Sweden want like. I might actually dislike what they like. <laughs> they probably hate me. <laughs> I don't know. But that's the point is um, there is this... There is a kind of essentialism in that idea mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the common thing between a group is so strong that it covers everything else. And this is where the tokenism comes into the picture. And this is where inclusion that you're taking a, mentioning into the processes need to have a different approach. For me, accountability in when it comes to inclusion and diversity is not about not making mistakes. And it's not about losing your job because you make mistakes. For me, accountability is about not making exactly the same mistake. Because every time you repeat, we repeat the same mistake on the decision-making level, we're contributing actively into entrenching the inequality that is already there. For me, accountability is about learning through that incremental process from the mistakes and making new mistakes. <laughs> because there will always be mistakes because this is about human nature. But repeating the same mistake is the mistake. I would also um, just like to come back to you on a, a word you used, uh, tokenism. Um, would you uh, like to define it and uh, talk a little bit more? It's a pretty unhealthy form of um, identity politics. Not all identity politics is bad. Um, <clears throat> I think when it's, it's when the common definition is that when you, we choose a person as a representative for a whole group based on the idea that that group is so homogeneous or our understanding that is so homogeneous. So um, like the question I've been asked by that programmer, uh, assuming that I would have the same interests at, as, as that young population born in Sweden just because we happen to have the same uh, ethnic or language origin. Uh, I think it's devastating because, um, you know, the, the impact, the historical impact of those social um, phenomena such as racism, sexism, ableism, and so on, uh, is, is, is their base is essentialism. You know, believing that you are your color of skin, you are your gender, you are your age, you are ability or whatever and trying to solve that by the same essentialism which which um, 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 tokenism implies uh, it's it's a major mistake um, so don't think essentialism think about experiences we are different because we have different experiences it's the color of skin or the gender of the age that creates the experience. What is common is the experience. But statistically speaking, the experience did not go on average through the group. So it depends who you pick from the group, you will get a different picture. So there is no one individual who would represent the whole demographic. And this is why tokenism is devastating, because it reduces experiences of a whole community or the experiences of a whole demographics to experiences one individual. 
Is there anything you'd like to add on? That? Well, actually, yeah. uh, this is a very, very important point, and I'm so happy that you open up this way because somehow it connects to how I see the whole discussion. Uh, of course, the, the, the inter intersectional approach uh, to the little, little things which combines our identity is very important because they are in action in every interaction uh, we do in, in, in the groups, in the systems, in the societies. But I believe that we should also take this diversity, equity and inclusion discussion a bit far beyond the national identities, a, a ethnical backgrounds and everything. There we will understand the diversification of the thought, cognitive diversity and experiences can be vary in in any group that you might think these are a cloud of certain <laughs> identities moving and doing the same thing together. So uh, I, I believe that we should uh, look at the uh, spaces and the, and the people that we work with and, and also offer content with those lenses. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so we've been talking really about organizations as sort of individual islands but no organization is an island so let's let's go bigger <laughs> let's go uh the sort of societal structure that we're working in and, and here we come to the the power dynamics um at work again um so what's wrong <laughs> and what do we do about it <laughs> What's wrong with us? The, the thing that is wrong with us is that we're human. That we, we, you know, we're not perfect. I mean, the digital thing. You know, when the AI came into the picture, people start started saying that we can make better decisions through the artificial intelligence. And now we know from several examples, which is now it's probably sounds predictable, but specifically in North America, we've seen different examples of. Um, legal cases when the judges were who were judging on discrimination cases were looking at the database of previous judgments and they just replicated the previous judgments mm -hmm. because the bias was built in into the system so again when it's a bias system then it's a bias system so uh, the ai maybe can evolve on its own terms and being inhuman to be perfect, but we will never be perfect. This is why we need to talk to each other and we need to get away from this, you know, social engineering thinking. When it's, we need to understand this is power dynamics, redistribute power, that's the only way forward. And the, what's wrong with us? That's is that we're human. <laughs> the redistributing, redistributing of power, what does that look like? I might be naive, but I like the 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 uh, <laughs> the um, the, um, the system that was introduced in the UK. I think with the Equality Law of two thousand ten, mm -hmm. which is what called Equality Duty. It's a fancy name. The idea is pretty simple. It basically, what they're saying is that as an organization, before you know when you 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 planned your project whatever it is before making the decision you basically go back to the communities that are affected and you check with them what they see you don't pick up one individual push that person into a board you go to a community you come to organizations who represent the communities you try to get as much feedback as possible say what do you see in this how is this going to impact you and then you try to mitigate between different interests because no decision will be ever perfect but that creates um a different dynamics in in the dialogue in the democracy if you wish maybe it's not a full you know change of power but it it's it's a different base for the future rather than you know Jada, what do you think? Uh, how is the, Kurd, uh, the, the Turkish, my, you know, it's... Well, actually, I completely agree with you because uh, when it comes to power, first of all, we all should remember that whatever decision we make uh, in terms of engaging with artists and making decisions and hiring and supporting funding, uh, anything uh, in arts and cultural sector, it's an exercise in your power. So because when we talk about power, we have a tendency to think about the, the toppest part of the hierarchy and expect that they will make one
some magical decision and everything will be fine. Uh, and accountability also uh, somehow should be seen in, in personal level, because there are certain simple actions that we could include our daily work and try to change and which might also uh, affect the result of, of more inclusive. And I totally agree with your mom because my also advocacy work based on dialogue, uh, because when we try to come together as human human on a digital <laughs> uh, domain or in person, preferably in person, then of course we uh, we have better understanding and empathy of the different experiences. And then maybe the discussion goes to another level. And then I think creative sector, arts and cultural workers, we have all the ability we have possibility to make and organize an event for any topic that we don't want to uh, do some mistake or maybe learn more and just include uh, expert organizations, uh, artists, activists who have a knowledge. And I think internet is, is full of very useful knowledge about uh, things that we could learn from and develop. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I like what you're saying about it being uh, involved in every aspect um, mm -hmm. of of our work that that is an exercise in power if it's if it's hiring if it's meetings if it's uh choosing who is going to be a speaker at a at a, sure. <laughs> at a conference for example um what would you say to people um about the what would be the difference between an ef effective policy in, in this kind of area and those box ticking exercises mm -hmm. what makes um a, an action really worth taking and not just I mean, the sort of tokenism of, uh, of actions. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I was one of those people who introduced tick boxing in one organization. <laughs> so I'm guilty. Um, look, but ticking the box is fine. It's not the end of the world. It's, it's not a bad thing. It, it could be helpful, but it's only helpful as a background to some real review of the experiences what we were discussing before with the accountability if you're going to make the same mistake again um, we can tick all the boxes or stop ticking the boxes it doesn't make it doesn't help mm. uh, but reviewing the mistake being open moving from democracy in the organization to the deliberate you know deliberative democracy when we actually go through things discuss them learn what was wrong and try to make not to make the same mistake or at least let it put it this way let's let's say we will do the same mistake maximum four times then you're not allowed to do it <laughs> that's the incremental learning process right um, otherwise ticking the box I don't know, you know, people quit or they get fired and then we exchange them by another person and things, it, it's going to be different. It's not going to be different because it's, this is probably a hard way to put it, but we are not a part of the system. We are the system. <laughs> so, you know, we need to be more reflective on what we're doing, how we're doing it. And, and you know, including people, it just, it's, it's it's not inclusion for the sake of inclusion it's inclusion for the sake of you know transforming the org our organization in something different and if we follow the idea of being a laboratory we should be a laboratory for the rest of the society because diversity is you know an, an essential part of critical thinking mm -hmm. and good decision making yeah, yeah. I think this critical thinking and reflecting critically on our uh, own work and also the, the environment that we are operating is the core of it. And then uh, just trying to understand that what one can do with the given responsibility, uh, responsibilities and positions. And one somebody, I always like to use this metaphor because this responsibility or who's going to take action, it's like a ball of fire. When you throw it, nobody wants to catch it because it's very, very um, hard to take it. And then, okay, now it's my turn. But I think little actions could make a big difference. So maybe focusing on actions, then diving into so much discussion. Okay. 
recognize this is the situation, what one can do, or who is missing here, or I mean, which organization or, or person could be useful for us to, to make this transformation better for everyone. I think pandemic just showed that because marginalized or to be marginalized uh, in an arts and cultural sector, it's not like predeterminately uh, attributed like uh, immigrants or, or let's say underrepresented minorities. It can be anyone and independent players, freelancers, all of a sudden just face that difficulty so it's it's about the whole well-being of the ecosystem i think yeah absolutely and uh since i know that you're <laughs> itching to talk about it um a lot of the time when we talk about inclusion as you say it seems so overwhelming uh it's, it's such a a big topic and such an omnipresent issue um so maybe we should try to help out with uh something practical <laughs> And can I ask you um, to tell us maybe how can we, um, what can what can people in cultural organizations dealing with cultural mobility um, in a digital context, what can they do in order to be more inclusive? Where can they start? <laughs> how can they? I think on the decision making process, <laughs> one thing is to, to accept our humanity and accept that we are biased and accept that we need to talk to others who have different experiences so we can see where we are biased and not to take it personal. I'm not a bad person, I'm a human, and that's why I'm biased. So learning from the others, uh, from other experiences, and skip the political correct talk. I mean, it was, I, Gwen on the previous panel said something about all those men stopped calling me and telling me this is not important and I don't know how to deal with this. That's exactly what we don't know how to deal with when it's silent, when everybody goes, I believe in everybody equals worth. Oh, what a big surprise. This is not helpful. We need to go down to the real issues that are relevant for our organization and to discuss what needs to be changed, learn from the experiences and skip the political correctness, I think. Mm -hmm. What I can say, actually, there was a very nice uh, statement in the report uh, on the Mo Produce. Congratulations, by the way. And I quote there from, from the report, if online was a country, it would have been the largest mobility destination in 2021. Uh, let's assume that, let's reimagine that this is a country, means that we have all the right to start from a white paper, right? We can set up new norms, we can put new rules, we can even develop new working methods. So why don't we take that opportunity instead of carrying the earlier uh, actions and then take them to the digital domain? So in that way, I would say this could be a mindset to start with, at least to motivate ourselves. And then to put maybe a target, seeing something like equitable, uh, ethical, uh, without allowing, let's say, labor exploitation in arts and culture. Uh, it's a it's a huge uh, problem, and without uh, repeating business as usual ways of working, um, like a let's say mission. <laughs> And then, um, I mean, I would suggest this is something I suggest everyone. I mean, you can list three actions you believe which will enhance your work. And you can say that, okay, I have been doing these decisions or this planning from a certain corner, a certain position, for instance, being in Finland, having accessibility to well functioning grant system for majority, and, and this and that, okay, what if? If I change my perspective and try to do it from another angle, there maybe um, different uh, partners and concern organizations can help. And then mm, just very simple, um, easily doable actions, not to paralyze ourselves. And maybe another way would be, uh, which was mentioned during the earlier panel, a kind of guidelines, how to be inclusive in our daily work. I mean, what to do, which kind of lenses that we can do, short to-do list maybe, and please not to-do list edition, and what would be the challenges, because everybody has different um, context and responsibility and working methods, and we are, of course, responsible and reporting, and we are somehow shadowly uh, manipulated a certain funding systems and so on, and, and if there are certain challenges, 
challenges identified, the kind of proposed alternative solutions would be the way. And it's very, very easy to enter the, uh, to this dialogue. And already Petra mentioned, I'm also one of the contributors of uh, Stop Hatchet now. It's an uh, anti-racist and feminist platform. And if you go to website, you will find incredible amount of information available. So simple, doable, a little things, I would say. Fantastic. Um, also, by the way, uh, I didn't mention at the beginning, but uh, like Irene in the last session, uh, I was also working on the shift project. And as part of that, uh, we have a, a guide for cultural organizations on inclusion. So you can also check that one out. <laughs> um, at this point, uh, would you have any examples uh, of, of good practice in this area that, that you have uh, that you have seen? in terms of digital mobility. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, currently, what I like that there was an input from the South Africa uh, with uh, very uh, thoroughly studied examples. And uh, I am also a part of a uh, social uh, imagination process uh, initiated and incubated by a Demos Helsinki, a Nordic think tank. And I'm one of the uh, founding alliances, which is an international gathering. and. There, for instance, uh, there has been so much discussion about how to uh, create uh, a different perspective and how to bring um, good examples from, for instance, Global South or from the uh, without uh, being more focused on this Eurocentric mm -hmm. solutions. So um, these are, of course, uh, good examples. And uh, in Finland also, I, I've seen that many organizations uh, developed a certain ways of doing when it comes to how to use digital domain. But still, what was lacking to my understanding, and that's why it's also easy to build something better, uh, that we all the time um, trying to do better, but uh, maybe not focusing much on freelancers or independent or a small operators because there there is so much need for capacity resources and networking uh, it was also said uh, during the earlier discussions i mean one cannot become overnight uh, a, a video maker yes that's very true and i would like to also maybe propose for the established arts and cultural institutions mostly publicly funded ones to open up their resources and to this kind of in-kind contributions and I think about a, a emerging or young or, or recently graduated musician who has been suffering from this two and a half years COVID situation, never had a real uh, in in-person uh, situation and that talented person, if they would like to send um, some kind of recording uh, to a very important audition in their professional career, I mean, they are without means. Yeah. I think that would be the way uh, for the institutions to talk about it. And that discussion happened partly in Finland. So this was a good example for me. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Uh, it, it rings a bell from what we were talking about earlier, where it, it's not just um, about having digital skills, but also having access to the um, the technical equipment we need, to the uh, computer programs that we need um, in, in order to actually be able to generate any visibility at all. Um, so I, I think that, uh, that this is a, a really good point. Um, is there anything else that uh, either of you would really like to add that has not been said yet? As we reach the closing <laughs> point. We can talk for hours. Yeah, <laughs> more and more. <laughs> um, well, maybe uh, what I could say, uh, because we wear different hats, of course, we are professionals working in arts and cultural sector, but we are also audience <laughs> and we are possible consumers of the uh, of the content and I recently read because I have a background in music festivals so I'm still my heart beats for music uh, it seems that global music market um, was uh, the growth in 2021 was quite big and yeah. currently it worth 26 billion I wrote here US dollars and uh, even the highest level since 1990s mm -hmm. but if we think about what actually comes to the pockets of musicians <laughs> after all those business it's very 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 limited and we also know that it's even 
impossible to have a um, meaningful uh, income through this streaming and now already mentioned this blockchain and nft and all these new disruptions uh, we don't know what will happen, but maybe what we could do that we could also in our own consump consumption, mm -hmm. uh, we could try to be more, um, how to say it, careful and responsive uh, to the field, because we have also that hat <laughs> and sometimes we forget that. Also, when it comes to political correctness, I have a favorite quote, if I may read it, it's Please. a short one. Um, <laughs> when I'm always left with the feeling that when it comes to inclusion, equality, it's too much political correctness. We always do things that are not relevant instead of doing the relevant things. And this is a quote. This is the first page in Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about being predictable. Um, and it goes like this. This planet has or rather had a problem uh, which was this, most of the people on it were unhappy for pretty much of the time. Many solutions were suggested for the problem, but most of these were largely concerned with movements of small green pieces of paper, which is odd because, um, <laughs> because on the whole, it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. So doing something completely irrelevant is not helpful. So it's, you know, it's, it's, let's sit down and look what the problem is. Just don't move papers. And on that note, <laughs> I think that's a, a great place for us to um, finish our discussion and uh, go to questions. But uh, just before that, I just want to thank uh, both Jada and Yamam for uh, their contributions. And again, to On The Move for inviting us all here today. Thank you. Already here? <laughs> Sit on? Yeah. Marianne Divleg. Um, I will describe myself later because I have to also give a speech. Uh, but anyway, hair the color of the North Sea when it's um, feeling very unhappy. Uh, <laughs> a a 70 year old, 71 year old white woman wearing black. Um, I really, I mean, I've had to cross out whole parts of my speech, which will doubtless please the people who are staying on to the end and have to listen to me at the, at the end. So really, thank you for everything you said. It's, it's just fascinating. I also wanted to highlight, Seda, what you said about the joy and the beauty of working in the art sector, where honestly, with very few limits, we're able to create events, uh, create um, initiatives, create things almost unlimited, um, whatever we want to do and whatever we want to focus on. And yeah, mom, I've heard you before and I've read you before and I love you. Um, <laughs> my husband is Thank not you. watching this video. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I've had, uh, for better or worse, like most of us, I've had a lot of time to reflect lately. And you brought up the, the question of power. And you also gave an anecdote of, um, I assume, working with a local authority, you know, commissioning somebody to go into the neighborhood and, and ask people things. And it's the very word inclusion that now starts to really bother me, because inclusion, for me, has an assumption, we will let you be included mm -hmm. in what we're doing. And um, I, we could talk all night long about this, but I'll leave it at that. Could you reflect on that, please? And I'm, I mean, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, as you said, we can, we can, do, well, thank you for the kind words. I think you're right. The, the word is, is signaling something we're not intending to signal, but it also, the, the terminology historically in this area has been very complicated. We've been moving from one set of words to another set of words. Did it make us more better at expressing what we're actually trying to do? I'm not sure. The problem is that there are no exact words for, for those social phenomena that we're trying to handle. And personally, for myself, I, I skip the terminological uh, debate because uh, it takes 
it takes the attention from the from the you know the discussion of the power dyna dynamics but you're right i mean this is not the I mean, it's the opposite of exclusion. By that, maybe we're we're saying we excluded you while we included you back. Maybe we should add the back thing. You know, uh, I I don't know. Uh, I don't have the best words for it, but it it is a problematic word. Uh, I think power dynamics is somewhere somewhere it's not used enough in 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 the sector, uh, at least in the the diversity industry which i'm part of <laughs> i almost don't hear very few people speak of the power dynamics and i think because everybody understands that the real issue nobody wants to really touch it by saying that maybe include if inclusion put in the context of power dynamics then and maybe it gets a better connotation i don't i'm not sure you're, you're right and i don't have the answer for it <laughs> Maybe I can also comment and thank you very much. Uh, that's a very, very important um, part of the whole discussion because the terminology that we use and what we mean by those words creates a certain perception. And of course, if you look at again from the power dynamics, who is entitled to include whom? Yes. I mean, <laughs> I'm including you or my knowledge I am including you. I mean, this is a very complex process and I think we should be very, very careful. And I know that I'm aware that the similar discussion is going on when it comes to uh, how to decolonize our work. I mean, <laughs> uh, who is going to do this this thing? And sometimes the, even the discussion goes to that direction. Who wants to be included to a certain uh, racist, discriminative structure? And we want to have a new structure from the beginning from the scratch but of course if we enter to discussion from that angle uh, it also creates a certain feeling that it's not easy to build a trust and dialogue and i believe that uh, it's much more wiser to see it again as i said as a competence i mean bringing a certain knowledge bringing certain perspectives to be able to respond to the needs of our society and all global challenges on the level that we are able to present Reduce. and this cannot be from a single position and homogeneous perspective so but this is a very important discussion thank you i think if i if i may just add i think it's um <clears throat> i love quotes because when wise people say good things we shouldn't rephrase we them because we destroy them one of my favorite people in this area is sandra fredman who's been one of the main researchers in the UK when it comes to the equality law. And she's been questioning the European equality law because it is built on the idea of equality of opportunity, because it's too formalistic, it's not real, it's not about fairness. It's about equality of opportunity and then it stops. And there is a quote, I'm not gonna read it on the quote, but what she's saying there is that redistributive policies when it comes to decision-making, decision, decision -making, it's politics. And if the cultural sector wants to do politics, let's do politics, you know, uh, and then it doesn't matter if it's called inclusion or not. Uh, I'm not saying your question is irrelevant, but it, in that sense, your question is relevant. If we skip the power dynamics, yes, the terminology becomes very important. Hi, I'm Julianne Arab, uh, International Advisor at ONDA, uh, which is the National French Office for Performing Arts Distribution. Um, I'm white passing, but I belong to the same ethnic group as you, mom. So I could, I've been asked this question so many times yeah. that you mentioned. <laughs> um, and I have short brown hair, uh, brown eyes, and wearing black. Um, I really like how you formulated the uh, the notion, uh, your, your definition of accountability on accountability not being, not making a mistake, but not making a mistake again. And I wonder, I mean, it comes though with the premise that institutions or organizations are willing to admit that they have made a mistake in the first place. So my question, and maybe it goes also about how organizations and the system resists, but also how, if you can maybe think with us on how do we deal with the inability of organizations and institutions 
to re-question themselves and to build on individual and collective knowledge within their within every organization to actually ask these questions and admit where it went maybe wrong and take it from there i don't think i have an answer for that i don't know if you have <laughs> look it's it's a very comp it's it's con contextual that's that the global injustice put in one organization right that's where we are mm. i'll give one example which is devastating i'm not going to mention the organization it's a, it's a big organization international organization working with human rights human rights not culture and arts and the highest person in that in in in, in that organization used the n-word in relation to black people in the organization several times and then that person had to leave the organization and they replaced by another person. And I was a part of informal discussion about, uh, I mean, what happened there. And for me, it was not interesting what happened there. For me, it was interesting, how could it happen several times? Because it's not, it was not only one time. When the head of, on the, of the organization goes so wrong, where are all, where is all the security in the organization? Did that person really had to leave? If the first time somebody has said, look, you're, you're aware what you're saying, maybe that person should have, could have stayed as well. I don't know if that person said it intentionally or not. My, my, my impression, it was not intentional, it was just lack of understanding of the context. But this is not to defend the person or the organization. This is just to say, if we keep doing the same mistakes, mm. How do we stop? So, I call it organizational integrity. I do consulting. I talk to a lot of employers and, and, and I, my impression, they love the idea that the day, you know, the hour you, I leave the room, they forget about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I used to say to all leadership positions, don't be afraid you're not worse than anybody else. You're just as bad as Ben else. Yeah. So it's fine. Do your mistakes. And it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Then you leave the room and they call you two days later. And that, I don't know. It's human nature. <laughs> no Maybe what I could add, uh, of course, it's also a kind of generation right now. There's another uh, future uh, artists and art makers are coming uh, and their realities, their discussions are maybe even much more advanced than our generation. And I believe it's also important to open up uh, those possible discussions in uh, high educational institutions for arts, because if current students, artists and professionals are not able to practice and learn and unlearn and just get this knowledge during their education. It's there is no magic when they are out in the in the system when they have this decision making positions and so on, they will eventually become inclusive, I think, and also many uh, research show that the change happens on human level, it's easier when you are on your younger uh lives or younger years of your life so we become more stiff uh, when we get older maybe towards certain norms that we are a very uh, uh tend to 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 practice so i i believe that there is that would be also another way uh to open up this discussion and involve with organizations if art institutions are there to be uh open space i mean independence of the thought academia democracy everything whatever way you name it it's 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 important that discussion also should take place there i agree maybe one thing that i i was arguing for that for a number of years but i don't like the idea so i've, I've taken it back but i'm giving it is <laughs> it's money you know they say follow the money right i mean the, the americans are pretty much pragmatic so the compensations levels are very high in courts and everything else when me too was over one of the things that was done in sweden based in stockholm is reviewing what went wrong what should we do differently and there was a commission who would look and come up with a number of ideas and my expectations was that they will propose was normally fits in into the Swedish labor market system very well. It's, you know, collective bargaining agreements. 
put it there. Mm -hmm. If you don't do, if you don't stop the mistakes, it's a contract bridge. It will cost you a lot of money, right? That might stop people. It was not put on the paper because it will change the power dynamics. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> Or criteria for funding. Or criteria for funding, yeah. I have another question over here. My name is Eric Söderblom. Uh, I'm a theater and opera director and the head of Espo Theater, which is also called the International Theater of Finland. I have uh, dark hair, um, egg glasses, dark egg glasses, white, white shirt and uh, green pants. Um, yeah, I want to actually, somehow the discussion you have had, thank you very much, it's very, been very interesting. Uh, I would want to touch a kind of dilemma that is lurking somewhere in the shadows, and that's the uh, relation between, let's say, freedom and accountability. Uh, can we really, I mean, is it, let's put it this way, if the financer of the field would really uh, have, have the power of saying, you don't get the money if you don't uh, act accountability, like with, with an accountability, of course, the change would be faster. Now we don't do it, that in Finland at least. I know that, for example, in England, uh, it might be tougher. Uh, but uh, my question is this, do we really have time to wait for the people, knowing that they are people, human, with all those issues that humans have, that we will be so in, well informed that we, without any quite tough push from outside, really become accountable, really stand for our kind of, okay, this was a mistake, I will change. Otherwise, we could, we, the only thing that will go on is the discussion about accountability. There's this danger. Uh, how, how do you relate to this? <laughs> Maybe I can take it first. I would like to be, I mean, I have been working for arts and cultural field more than 20 years, and it was a personal and conscious choice why I ended up this sector and i would like to be loyal to my own sector and i would like to believe or keep the belief that we don't need any stick <laughs> from any direction to embrace this discussion if we really feel that now is the time because the current uh, structures not operating perfectly for everyone or the global challenges that we have to solve and and the whole COVID. Uh, as an example, it's still there, very vivid, and we know how it affected the, the, the artists and cultural professionals and creative brain drain and, the drain and everything. I really would like to believe that the sector, which is there, exactly how you said, uh, research and development department of the society, and from the definition, it's there to produce or reproduce humanistic values and, and philosophical values, can do that. I mean, of course, it's nice when it comes maybe from there that you feel more obliged. But I don't feel that for this specific thing we need it. And there is so much also research and, and study which proves that this is a need. For instance, one, I cannot remember which organization, but I can later share it with on the move team. Uh, it's proved by a study, the biodiversity happens on a global level where the cultural and linguistic diversity is also quite rich. So it's a direct link <laughs> to the uh, climate crisis. It's about the sustainability of us and it's our responsibility to the earth and everything. So. I think we can do it, we don't need stick. So this is what I can say. <laughs> and I agree, we should be able to do it without yeah. a stick. That's, that's a very good point. The, the problem with this field is that you keep saying to people, what's wrong, but you never can answer the question. You keep saying, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I mean, the Canadians tried that, right? I mean, I, mean, um, I think um, Arts Council Canada has been gone farther than the British did, I think the Australians did that as well. Is that what we need? Then that's what we need in Europe, at least. Um, but we shouldn't need it, but we obviously need it. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, there are, I mean, okay, public funding, there are criteria, then we should question the criteria. Uh, there are criteria that may be not needed anymore, and there are new criteria that is needed. 
who's going to do that. I don't know, but it is an idea, definitely. Maybe the cultural sector can itself ask the yeah. public funder to change the criteria, <laughs> you know. Um, that would be very, very brave. That would be very great. But it's, it's, um, it's a difficult exercise mm. because you're asking somebody to fund you on certain yeah. premises That's and you're going to eat it up if you know. I mean, it's, it's a question to two a little bit. And very short before, and I would like to still disagree <laughs> uh, because uh, I don't like the idea that it's predeterminedly related to extra funding. Then, okay, give us the money, then we will be inclusive. I don't think so. I think it should be with, within the current resources. And of course, we need to create a pressure group uh, for the policymakers to be more responsive to the needs of the current uh, arts sector but i believe still it should come from us any other questions be christopher g6 culture in transit she her mid to late 50s um, just and it's a, it's a kind of it's a big question, I guess, towards the end of this session. But you're both picking up on risk. You know, how can we do things differently unless we step out into a space where the world around us is not comfortable? And whether that's the program that we we drive, whether that's the people that we work with, whether it's the structures that we've got. So, I guess it's a question, and you're starting on it there, your mum is how do we? How do we, as a cultural sector, encourage risk taking in those whose job it is to look after public money? How do we persuade them that I might fail? Yeah, I, I think one way, I'm, I'm, I still love the idea of consultation, you know, talk to each other as a nonprofit specifically. Let's go and see what the biggest organization, I mean, okay, let's take one example, disability. I mean, I live in a country when there is a national uh, authority that works with research on disability. It's not the equality ombudsman. It's not the part that will take you to court if you do something wrong. They just provide information and research. And I've been telling every organization in Sweden I've been talking to, before you go further with your project, just give them a call because they have the latest information how to make, you know, spaces, digital or physical, uh, you know, accessible. Just give them a call, send them your project description and ask, what do you see there? Do, do you see something wrong? Just give me the feedback. And if, if, if we're not willing ourselves to take that little initiative, then probably it's the funding. <laughs> I agree with you. And for instance, in Finland, there is another um, organization called Culture for All and they provide incredible information about, of course, accessibility and diversity, inclusion and, and linguistics and everything. So, and this accumulated knowledge uh, in those organizations and even independent uh, platforms are there and they are ready to share and they are open to collaborate. I think it would be nice just to have a reality check and have a dialogue and at least to see the shortcomings of certain commitments before even uh, try and, and possibly have some failure in it yeah i would suggest the same thing <laughs> okay we have three minutes left if anybody else wants to pose any questions a comment <laughs> Yes, so just uh, a comment with what you are saying, because um, you mentioned as well, I mean, you've been hearing it a lot that everything, all these variables that we need to be aware of are kind of overwhelming. And you also said that um, we're humans, right? So there's flaws, but there's also positives. We're intuitive and we just need to a little bit rewire our intuitions because a lot of the things that feel overwhelming are just in many cases, basic common sense. So we just lost some of our basic intuitions on what is wrong and what is right. And sometimes it's much easier than we think it is. So I just want to give this comment to 
which contradicts my previous comment, but <laughs> I love doing that, right? So, so yeah, but uh, yeah, I just felt that if we keep on feeling and saying how overwhelming this work mm. is, where we deprive ourselves of our own agency over this mm. uh, topic mm. and over these issues and over these variables to take into consideration, when I think we have the agency that's necessary to just remember who we are. Mm. Can I, I just, a very small thing uh, as, as a reflection to that, because this is something very much bothering me. Uh, any, any discussion related to diversity inclusion comes as a big elephant in the room. And this is how we frame it, or it has been framed. Instead of uh, framing it, of course, it's a new learning, it's joy, it's just get to know different perspective and, and do something together in a different way, because we are all tired of certain routines so it's also again question of how we frame the whole discussion and from which angle we would like to enter it of course when it is a big elephant and problem everybody feels so tense yeah i think i'm the elephant every time there was like oh now they're talking about me again <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I know that there was interest to ask some more questions. Uh, we will be available afterwards. I'm sure uh, Yamam and Jada will be happy to talk. Uh, but that is uh, the end of our session now. Uh, so once again, I just want to say thank you to all of you and to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.